my plan for tonight. We have three chapters left. Um, the first two chapters deal with David, the last chapter um, Saul. And then if we have time, depending on how we spend our time, we um, will spend a few minutes thinking about some ideas that stand out uh, from this book. I'll explain the balcony a bit of it. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 29. Um, so Saul is still uh, pursuing David, right? This has been going on for like the last three Wednesdays. And uh, we've been following these two back and forth. Um, Saul has, you know, the camera's kind of been swinging back and forth between these two. Sometimes the camera overlaps like we had last Wednesday. And, um, but mostly we're kind of go, going back and forth between the two. David has had multiple opportunities to take Saul's life, but he hasn't. Saul hasn't been successful in killing David. And then you'll remember um, last week in chapter 27, David went to Gath, and um, that's where King Achish is. We've run into him a few times now in this book. And he has this deceptive plot where he makes the king think that he's actually on their side, right? So he, the king says, where have you been? He says, well, I've been um, raiding these Israelite towns. He's like, oh, okay, so you're with us. When in actuality, he had been raiding um, different groups, the Amalekites and the Geshurites and all these Philistines. And so this, you know, this deception has really become a hallmark of David, as we've seen throughout this book. Um, but Achish buys it. So in chapter 27, verse 12, it said, Achish trusted David. He said, he will always be my servant. So Achish is convinced that David has burned bridges with the Israelites, and he's on his side. Um, and so it kind of leaves you wondering, like, how is this going to be resolved, right? Like, David, we know, is the anointed king of Israel, but he's uh, pretending to be on the Philistine side for this. Um, and yet here he is posing, you know, with the Philistines as a Philistine to go against the Israelites. Chapter tw- that was chapter twenty-seven. Chapter twenty-eight, the the camera swings back to Saul, and you remember he went to this medium, the witch of Endor, and he's trying to figure out what's going to happen. And she summons the spirit of Samuel, and he gets this prophecy that, you know, actually um, tomorrow you'll be with me. And so that, that's kind of the context going into chapter twenty-nine. So the camera's swung back now to David. So look at verse one in chapter twenty-nine. So now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek. I'll pause here and actually say that this book is about to wrap up, and you'll see that where we are right now is actually kind of where this book began. If you go back to chapter 4, many Wednesdays ago, where we started, you know, at that point, all we really knew about was Samuel. We hadn't met Saul yet. We certainly didn't know David. And that's exactly the scenario they were in. The Israelites were with Samuel, and, and it says that the Philistines were encamped at Aphek in chapter 4. You remember from there, of course, that's when the ark was captured, and then uh, they had treated it as a token, and we went on and on from there. So, so here they are, back at Aphek, back at, about to go to battle with the Philistines. And again, the unusual plot twist here is that David is on the side of the Philistines, and so that's kind of what has to be reconciled in this chapter. Verse 2, as the lords of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish. I'll pause there. How do... Achish's commanders feel about this idea of David fighting with them against the Israelites. What's their reaction to this? They don't trust him. Verse 3, the commanders said to Achish, what are these Hebrews doing here? A reasonable question, right? Now, how does Achish respond to them? What's that? That's right, read, uh, I think this is verse 4. Is, is this not David? the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years. And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. So yeah, it's, come on, it's David. We know David, right? He's on our side. He, he was fighting those uh, Israelite um, towns. He was raiding those Israelite towns. So you get this impression that this Achish guy is just either naive or um, gullible. You'll remember that this is the same king that back in chapter 21 when David is kind of in a tight spot and he says, how am I going to get out of this? He, you remember he acted like a madman until the king was just like, we don't need him on our side. Send him away. So he's already kind of fallen for this performance once. Um, and then, again, back in chapter 27, like we just mentioned, he's the guy that believes David's lies about, um, about raiding these Israelite towns who weren't actually Israelites. But they were and so now here he is convinced that having David on his side is a good idea. Again, verse 3, I have found no fault in him to this day. And so this doesn't make 
his commander is very happy, right? And understandably so. So reading on, they were angry. Uh, send him back. Don't let him come with us. And then they bring up this song that we just, just keeps coming up in this book over and over again, right? Saul has slain his thousands. David has tens of thousands. Why are they bringing up this song? Who were the thousands that had been slain by Saul and by David? They were them, yeah. They're, they're saying, do you remember this is the guy that has the song that just that keeps killing us? So, so you can't really blame them for saying, hey, you know, is this really a good idea to have him on our side? Um, and then you'll even see, they say, do you think maybe he's just trying to mend his relationship with Saul, and the best way to do it would be to kill some of us in this kind of deceptive scheme? Um, if you go back to the start of chapter 28, when Achish and his men are getting ready to fight the Israelites, uh, Achish, has, Achish has this conversation with David where he's trying to make sure that David knows whose side he's on. And Achish says to David, he says, I will make you the keeper of my head. Which, if you're, if you're evaluating David, that's, that's kind of an ironic choice of words, right? Because here's a Philistine saying that you're the keeper of my head. Can you recall any situations with David and Philistine heads? Right? Right? Yeah, so he's the guy that cut off the head of Goliath. So you imagine these commanders just looking at, at Achish and saying, what are we doing? So verse 6, he call, so Achish kind of says, okay. So verse 6, he's, he calls David and he says, As the Lord lives, you have been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong in you. Uh, but, you know, I've got a problem. These commanders do not approve of you. Does anything stand out to you about his reply? Is anything remarkable to you about the choice of words that he applied to this? What am I thinking? Question. He says, as the Lord lives. So he's a pagan, right? He's not an Israelite. So kind of an interesting choice of words. It's not really explained to us. Is he, is he trying to um, uh, ingratiate David, or is he trying to, or has he really been persuaded by David? Um, but he tells David to go back, and then verse 7, you would think, you think David would be like, okay, great. Like, I was kind of in a tight spot. I wasn't sure how I was going to get out of this situation. But yeah, we'll go back, um, gladly. But how does David actually respond, verse 8? That's right. He says, what have I done? Why are you sending me away? Which is kind of an unusual reply. I'll pause here and say we're not going to do a study this night, but there's actually this really interesting, this phrase, what have I done? David says, what have I done when his brothers approach him there before he goes to fight Goliath? And they say, what are you doing here? He says, what have I done? When, um, John, when David runs to Jonathan and just as Saul is starting to pursue him, he says, what have I done? And then uh, they have an interaction in Ziph, David and Saul do, and he asks that same question, what have I done? So Keeps coming up. He says, what have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? So he's really selling this, right? He's really selling this. He's protesting Achish in favor of his own innocence. And again, um, we don't really understand the whole plot here, but you want to ask David, like, you have a chance to walk away from this situation? Why are you arguing to stay in it? Um, is, it, is it just feigning commitment? So it's really hard, in my opinion, to understand why this performance continues to be perpetuated, and I don't think it actually really explains it to us. But, but verse 9, Acre says, you know what? My hands are tied, David. Uh, I'm sorry, you got to go. And then again in verse 9, he says, you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God, which again, I'll say, kind of interesting choice of words for a pagan to, again, invoking this spiritual anger. But verse 10, David and his men leave. Um, before we move on here, I'll say, can you think of another instance in the Bible, and I ask this rhetorically, where God's anointed one was opposed by all the people and was taken before the leader who says to him, I find this guy blameless. Does that strike any chords? Right, yeah, this is Jesus. So you, we'll see another, um, there's, there's several antitypes of David uh, reflecting Jesus as we go through. Any thoughts on chapter 29 before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Don't I think, let, uh, yes, yes, I wouldn't condone the lying. It's interesting that, again, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that this has really become one of his hallmarks. He's been, he was deceptive when Saul came to his house and he snuck out. He was deceptive when uh, he was not showing up for those dinners with Jonathan. So he's really demonstrated this to be one of his character traits, that this kind of deceitfulness. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we're not studying 
Second Samuel, but with Bathsheba, that, that's deceptive. So you can see the seeds of it here all the way back. First uh, Samuel. Yeah, well. Is all, can I ask you a question? Why? So why then? Why is his taking the situation into his own hands? Why? Why was he not condemned for this? Like we saw Saul taking situations into his. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. Right. So he's kind of the only person in his corner. Totally agree. We have to, it has to be consistent with that. Yeah, I agree. Any other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. He's just trying to figure it out. He doesn't know what the plan is, but he knows he knows he's supposed to be anointed. He knows he's been anointed. He knows that he's not taken Saul. He could have taken it on, into his own hands and killed Saul multiple times, but he didn't. So, yeah, that's fair. All right. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Chapter 30. So David and his men, they've gotten kind of out of the situation uh, where they were going to have to fight, the, fight with the Philistines against the Israelites, and so... So they're no longer in the situation, so they've, they've been sent home. Verse 1, now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, 
and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men come to the city, they found it, came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So you can imagine the excitement they have getting to go home. They've been over there with the Philistines, and now they're getting to come home, and, and you can imagine their disappointment when they get there and realize, wow, there's nothing here. Every, the city's been raided. All of our family is gone. It's total silence. No animals, no people. How do they respond to this? Weeping. What's that? They were distraught. That's right. They mourn. They're stricken with grief to the point that they, they literally can't cry anymore. Um, David's two wives have been taken captive. Whom, whom do the people blame for this? David. Verse 6, the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. So we've already talked about it. He doesn't have anybody to turn to. So imagine how isolating this is. Saul's trying to kill him. His family's been taken. The Philistines have rejected him. He, his own men that have been with him through all of this are now turning against him, right? You can imagine these comments like, Man, we're worse off now than we were before. Like, at least we had our families to come back to. And so they say, you, it's your, it's your fault, right? And so here's David. He's, he's facing the prospect of being killed by his own people. And this is what it says in verse 6. It says that David was greatly distressed. So you wonder, what is he going to do now? It seems that he has hit rock bottom. How does David respond to this? Exactly right. So verse 6, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You know, we, we often talk about the difference between having a personal relationship with God and having this kind of intellectual understanding of who God is. And I think David's response to the situation really uh, demonstrates that he had that type of personal relationship. As we we'll mentioned, we could turn to multiple psalms and, and really expound on his emotions and what's going through his heart with all these just you know, compare to compare David's reaction here to what we saw from Saul um, back in chapter twenty-eight. Saul was in a rough spot, right? Saul um, is afraid that the king, he's losing the king, kingdom. Um, he goes to this medium, this witch, and it said back then that his heart was filled with fear. But he doesn't turn to God, and here's David strengthening himself in the Lord. What does it mean to strengthen oneself? you're exactly right. We don't have to speculate about what this means because we can read what he, what he does, which is exactly what you described. Look at verse 7. David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this man? Shall I overtake him? So was this, did David have this deep uh, emotional experience, and that's how he was strengthened in the Lord? Was it something that was better felt than could be understood? Um, remember who this Abiathar is. He was the son of Ahimelech. He was the guy that escaped when Saul destroyed all those priests. And so, so what does David do? He says, you know, Abiathar brings him the ephod, which, as you mentioned, the ephod was um, part of what the priests would use to get an answer from God. We're not really told in too much detail how this worked. But there were the Urim and the Thurim, and, and it was a way of God's communication with the priest. But let's generalize. What does he do? He asked to see what God had to say about the what does it mean for him to strengthen himself in the Lord? He went and sought what God had to say about the situation. Verse 8, he asked very clear questions. Shall I pursue these people? Shall I overtake them? He gets very clear responses. Pursue, you shall surely overtake, you shall surely rescue. All right, so that's one part of it. So his, his immediate response is to seek what God has to say about it. What does he do after he's been told what God has to say about it? What does it say he does in verse 
time. So David set out. So he obeyed, right? He asked what God said he should do, and then he obeyed. So there's um, 600, verse 9, there's 600 of them. They reach this river, and um, we'll come back to this in a few minutes, but 200 of them decide to stay behind because they're just too exhausted. But the, the point that I just wanted to make was, you know, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, and it says that David strengthened himself in the Lord, and it says that he asked what God wanted him to do, and then he obeyed, I think we can pretty well generalize that to us, right? If we want to be strengthened in the Lord, we can ask what God wants us to do, and we can obey. I don't think it's that common. Verse 11, this is kind of an interesting section here, 11 through 15. So they find an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. We won't read this whole section, but this Egyptian is um, dehydrated, he's weak, so they, they feed him and sort of resuscitate him, and then they ask him, you know, where are you from? Pause here. You know, if you go back to the start of this chapter, it, we're never actually told that David knew who had raided um, their towns, and so even, or even if he did know, he doesn't know where they are, and so there's logistically, like, he's going to set out and pursue them, but you've got to kind of figure out where to go and who to get. And so, what does the Egyptian tell them when they approach this guy? Man. That's right. I'm from Egypt, verse 13. I'm a servant to an Amalekite. My master left me, abandoned me, because I fell sick. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Sherathites, against that which belongs to Judah, burned Ziklag. So, David learns that the Amalekites have done what he had actually pretended to do, right? They actually invaded and raided an Israelite city, which is what he had just claimed to do but hadn't actually done. And ironically, he learns this because they were heartless enough to abandon this sick servant, and that's how they ended up finding out about it. So so now he knows who's done it. He knows who to pursue. He's got a guy telling them where to go. And so... So now they set off, and does it say, as we keep going through here, does it say that when they reach the Amalekites, they are um, prepared, uh, on guard, ready, defending themselves? Dancing. Behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, verse 16, eating, drinking, dancing, because of the great spoil they had taken from the land of the coast. So I would characterize this as carefree indulgence, right? Excess. It is a giant party, and they're very vulnerable, and they have no awareness of their vulnerability. Verse 17, And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So David and these 400 men, they go, they they, they have this comprehensive recovery, right? They get everything back. Nothing is lost. He gets his wives back. And so you see, just in the course of a few verses, how quickly things have changed for David, right? He He was alone. He didn't have his family. He had been rejected by the Philistines. His own troops were starting to neglect him, to, to reject him and thinking about killing him. And now they were going back to Ziklag and they're saying, man, this is because of David, right? This is what David's leadership has accomplished for us. And then um, verse 21, they, they started to head back and they reached this river where 200 had stayed behind. And, you know, of course, these people are excited too. How, how do the men with David feel about the 200 that had stayed behind? They don't deserve it. Right? Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we've recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children in his heart. Not surprising, right? Like, wait a minute, why do they get all this stuff? They stayed behind, they were too tired to come and fight, what, do, what did they do to get this? It's very uh, dismissive. And what, what does David say in response to that? They should share. Right, yeah. You shall not 
David said, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall all share alike. So David says, no, we're not going to do things like that, right? You're not going to keep all this for yourselves because it wasn't you that did it. It was God that did it for us, right? It's the, God's the one that preserved us. God's the one that gave them into our hand. God's the one that won this battle. And he, he doesn't just say this to them. He sets this down as a principle, right? He says, you know, going forward, everybody who contributes will share in this. And if you were to try and generalize what this principle means, they, these folks were essentially trying to say that, you know, they deserved the salvation, literally the saving of these people. They deserved the salvation because of what they had done, right? Do we ever encounter that elsewhere in the Bible, that, that, that people might claim that they deserve salvation because of what they have done? Right? So you see this principle all the way back in 1 Samuel, that here's people who don't recognize that their, what they receive came from God. They mistaken think that it came from their own doing. So David makes this a, a principle, right? Verse 25, he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. What does David do at the end of the chapter when they get back to Ziklag? That's right. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his, I'm using the SV, to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here's a present from you for, for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And then it lists all these elders from different cities. So you see this, this generosity. And again, I don't mean to make too much of looking for shadows or anti-types, but David was at rock bottom. He had no one to turn to. And then, turn of events, and by the end of the chapter, there's been salvation, and he's handing this out lavishly to people who were undeserving. Right? So you, can you fast forward to a time where God's anointed one was at rock bottom, and then there's salvation, and then he presents this spoil to people who were undeserving. So again, you can see these Antitypes of David all throughout the, throughout the chapter. Book. Okay. That's right. They had been sympathetic to them. Right. Exactly right. So he's sharing with them now that they've received all this spoil. Any other thoughts? All right. Last chapter. Um, all right, so now, that, so now that's it for David, for, for, uh, for this book. So now the camera swings back to Saul. Um, let's, let's think about Saul. Saul, when we began way back in chapter 9, what do we know about Saul? He was tall, handsome, he had been anointed, um, and given this commission that we've referenced now a few times. But back in chapter 10, he was told that you will save the people of the Lord from their surrounding enemies. Obviously, he does not end up doing that. Uh, but along the way, things have gone wrong for Saul, right? He has, um, here we are at the end of the, uh, end of the book, and he's about to die at the very hands of the people that he was supposed to deliver Israel from. And um, again, just at the end of the book, from a timeline perspective, the last time we saw Saul was back in chapter 28, where he's just been told through the spirit of Samuel that, you know, you're going to be with me, that this, this is happening tomorrow. And so now, starting in verse 1, Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchai Shua, the sons of Saul. <clears throat> um, verse 3, it, we, we read that we get this picture of Saul fleeing, and it's the archers that find him, and he's wounded by these archers. So when that happens, what order does he give to his armor bearer? Kill me. Draw your sword, thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me, thrust me through and mistreat me. So yeah, so he tells his armor bearer, let's be done with it. Take my sword, kill me. And what does the armor bearer say? No. Do you remember Saul's first armor bearer? David? If, if given the chance, would he take Saul's life? No, 
So we've seen that a few times. So um, we can go back, but in chapter 24, that's what David says. says, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, and put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So, so maybe that's the explanation that the armor bearer has. There's, there's, there's fear that you know, Saul is the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to be the guy, even at his direction, that attempts to kill him. And, and Saul's clearly trying to you know, preserve dignity and avoid mistreatment. And so, verse 4, he takes his own sword and he falls on it. You know, interesting that back in chapter 17, this is the same sword that David had refused to use to kill Goliath, right? And so now Saul takes it and takes his own life, and then the armor bearer follows suit. And so Saul and his three sons, as we just read, they all die on the same day. If you remember that back, way back, uh, in Samuel's farewell address back in chapter 12, that he had warned the people that if, if you and your king do wickedly, that you'll be swept away. And so here we are words of Samuel's prophecy being fulfilled. How do the Israelites react after they hear about Saul and his son? What's that? They run, they fled, they abandon. And so the Philistines come and live in their cities. And then um, verses 8 through 10, you really see the brutality of these Philistines, right? So they're cleaning up, they're stripping the fallen soldiers. They find Saul and his sons. They cut off Saul's head. They send messengers to tell everybody. They put his armor in the temple, fasten it to the wall. Just total disregard for human life. And then verse 9, um, again, they sent messengers throughout the land to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people to carry the good news. So this was you know, their gospel. This was their good news that we killed the king. Death defeated him. And then verse 11, but when the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshem. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them in the Tamarisk tree of Jabesh and passed for seven days. These folks from uh, Jabesh-Gilead, if you remember from back in chapter 11, these were the people that Saul had actually rescued that very first time. Um, and so these are the people that come and take down his body and his son's body and then bury them. So, you know, when the people asked for a king way back in chapter 8, obviously they never imagined things would have gone this way. You remember Saul's, Samuel's disappointment because he thinks, well, they've rejected me, and God says, no, it's not you, it's me they've rejected. And then here you see the folly of them selecting this guy who's ultimately now been killed by the people that he was supposed I've got some thoughts prepared. Any thoughts on um, this chapter before we a few extra minutes? Thoughts on that? It kind of ends abruptly, right? Because this isn't really the end of a book. This is the end of the first half of a continuation, which we can study later in the year. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but thanks for sharing. Any other thoughts? I um, we don't really have we didn't have a review class, um, so I uh, I tried to come up with some ideas that I think kind of stood out from this these last twelve weeks. Please feel free to jump in if you have any stuff to share. I had a teacher that uh, instead of doing reviews, she called it going to the balcony. And the idea was, yeah, we could sit here and rattle off what we studied in these chapters for the last 13 chapters, but she would use reviews as going to the balcony. So we've been kind of in the arena, but let's take a step above and kind of look at it from a different perspective with a more self-reflective.
So I went back and tried to come up with, through my notes, things that, ideas that stood out, um, certainly from the classes that I taught, but also the classes that Scott has taught as well. Um, God let the Israelites have what they wanted. God lets us have what we want. If you go back to um, chapter 8, I'm not going to read through this, but you know, Samuel's old. He tries making uh, his sons judges, and they just don't do a good job of it. They're taking bribes. And, um, and so the elders gather together, right, and they approach Samuel and say, hey, you know, your sons are not like you. We don't like this. Give us a king to judge us. Samuel takes it personally. God has to say, no, it's not you. It's me that they're rejecting. They've forgotten everything that I've done for them. And then God gives them this warning. So Samuel goes through, and you remember he enumerates all the ways that a king has failed. Right? He's going to take your sons and make them soldiers. He's going to take your servants for his own. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your land. He's going to take your vineyards. He's going to take your sheep and your cattle. And they say, no, you know, we want this. Give us a king. We want to be like all the other nations. And so Samuel goes back to God, and God says, obey their voice and make them a king. That's 8. And so even back then, we talked about the analogy between that and Romans 1, right, where Paul is writing to these Christians, and he's talking about all the ungodliness and all of the unrighteousness around them, he's making the point that, you know, even through the very creation, people are without excuse. People can clearly see God's power all around them, yet people still choose to not recognize God. And so, you know, there's a group of people who are seeking what after, what's after their own heart, not what God has for them. And God's given them warnings, and yet they still refuse those warnings. And so in Romans 1, do you remember what it says God gave them to? God gave them up to their own uncleanness. God gave them up to their passions. God gave them up to their own debased minds. So, um, so what does that mean for us? It's that God will let people make bad decisions, and we will bear the cost. I, uh, I often think about uh, Matthew chapter 6 and the Sermon on the Mount, and this idea, I think these are related, they're related in my mind, but the idea that we can be rich in treasures on earth or we can be rich in treasures in heaven, but we're all rich in something, right? We will all be rich in the thing that we choose to be rich in. And it's either what God wants for us or it's what we want for ourselves, but God will let us have the thing that we're seeking after. It just means that we'll bear the, the, the repercussions. Any thoughts on that? I've got more thoughts. Right now. Thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, that's right. And it's it's like Pharaoh's hardened heart. Like it, it the language can be a bit um, a bit tricky, but it's God wants all people to repent. But if you choose not to, then He'll let you not. You'll, you can go on believing the lie. You can chase after treasures on earth. You can be given up to a debased mind. If you want a king, he'll let you have a king. This theme that's throughout the Old and New Testament. It's a free and free will. Absolutely. That's right. Um, second thought that I jotted down was um, Saul leaning on his own understanding. So if you go back to chapter... 13, um, back when Saul makes this mistake, right? Samuel had told him to wait seven days. It's the seventh day. He looks across and he sees these Philistines. You remember like sand on the seashore, just innumerable Philistine soldiers. And the Israelites are starting to desert. They're hiding in caves. They're fleeing. They're going across the Jordan River. And uh, Samuel hasn't come. And so what does Saul do? He says, bring me the offering. I'll do it. He inserts himself into this role of priest, a role that he had not been appointed for. And he doesn't neglect the fact that the sacrifice needs to happen, right? That would be easy to point out and say, well, you clearly didn't do this. His problem was that he didn't have the faith that God would provide for him. And you remember Samuel says, you have done foolishly, for you have not kept the Lord's command. And as if that wasn't enough of a learning lesson, Two chapters later, chapter 15, God tells Saul to go and fight the Amalekites and kill and destroy everything. 
right? And so he takes these thousands of men, and they go and they fight them, but they spare the king, and they keep the king. They keep the sheep, they keep the oxen. You remember Samuel's approaching him, and he's like, what is this I hear? He can hear all these cattle and sheep that were supposed to have been killed, but he didn't kill. And so a further point, not only does Saul lean on his own understanding, but he leans on his own understanding to the point that he's blind to his own sin. When you look at chapter 15 and see how Samuel approaches Saul about this, Samuel says, why didn't you obey what God had commanded you? And Saul's reply is, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He doesn't even see the, the mistake that he's made. Um, he, 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 it even says that Samuel learned that Saul had set up a monument to himself. And then fast forward through this book, he's having priests killed, and he's trying to kill David, he's even trying to kill his own son. And so you see the, the snowballing effect of Saul's sin and the ramifications that it has for his ability to even have awareness of his own sin. I think that was a telling point. Me, what's your thoughts? I know, I think so, right? That's right. God let him have what he wanted to have, and to the point that he didn't even see anything wrong at what he was doing. And then the last take home that I had as I was going through this was just in contrast to um, Saul's behavior was the way in which David repeatedly inquires of God. David makes some mistakes. We've seen his the deceptive tendencies that he has, but uh, that expression. David inquired of God. You see it um, in chapter 22 when he leaves the cave of Adullam and he's talking to the king of Moab. He tells the king, he's like telling the king to watch out for his parents and he says, I don't know what God will do for me, but I, I will inquire. Verse, uh, chapter 23, when the Philistines attack the town of Keilah, before David goes, what's the first thing he does? He inquires of God. But then the men don't want to go, so he's not sure. What does he do? He inquires of God again. Uh, and then tonight in chapter 30, before he pursues these people, of God. And so you see, um, and we, as we talked about tonight, he strengthened himself in the Lord. What did that mean? Well, he inquired of God and then he obeyed. So you see this very stark contrast in his response to adversity versus Saul's, which I thought was a, a, a thing to think about this morning. Any other thoughts or anything that stood out before we wrap up? Yes, Zach. Thank you, everybody, for uh, a great class this quarter. Thanks for your participation. Um, I don't know who's, oh, it's um, Josh and Corey. Uh,